you have to show up to work every day. And for a lot of people, work sucks. Like that's, that's the actual reality. But uh, why would you do something that sucks every day? Um, but you, you have to, you're compelled to do this. And so what ends up happening is that most people end up having, you know, you rationalize, why am I doing what I'm doing? You like, you know, most people understand the world through some kind of cultural or ideological mediation. You like, there's kind of the blunt facts and then you have to deal with it and say, well, I'm dealing with this because of X, Y, Z. I'm, you know, it's because of this relationship with this person. It's because they're not, you know, this person has this attitude or, um, you know, something, something, you know, you can put Freud in here too. But like the fact is that like, you know, capitalism is here and it does these things. And then we have to just make sense of it because we're stuck in this situation. Um, and so this is where, again, bringing it back to, to Mia Tokamitsu's uh, article from 2014 of like this idea of do what you love. Uh, this is where these ideologies come out of that. Like you can't hide the fact that work sucks. You have to deal with the fact that like an employer has to deal with it as well as like the actual workers have to deal with the fact that like a lot of work is just kind of drudgery and it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be drudgery. Like the, I, I think we both agree that like there's certain work that has to be done. Like there's, there's some notion, unfortunately, on parts of the left of like, there's a post work society and maybe that will exist someday, but it does not seem at all foreseeable right now where, you know, everything is automated by robots, maybe, but I don't know. We'll see. Um, some work is probably going to happen, but the problem is that like most work happens today because it's for profit and mm -hmm. it's not for like what we actually need as a society. Like it's right. not, it's really irrational. It's like, there really is kind of an anarchy to, to capitalism because capitalists as individuals have certain compulsions to just make a profit all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And so we all have to make sense of it. And, uh, and that's why you should do what you love. That's, that's why like amidst all the chaos, do what you love and you'll never work another day in your life. I think what was so interesting and powerful about Mia Tokubitsu's article, especially in 2014, is that she really identified kind of this ideological mechanism where something that sounds really great or sounds really liberating actually sort of ends up uh, obscuring the wage relation and also like disadvantaging workers. Um, I think that that's all true. It's actually really reasonable and rational that people would want to do what they love because it's like, mm -hmm. if you have to work like for most of your life, why not have it be something that is actually kind of enjoyable, right? And that's kind of the the kernel, I guess, that sort of um, started, sort of started, you know, this aphorism, do what you love and you'll never work a day, work a day in your life. Uh, now, of course, we've seen how that has worked out. But you should do what you love. Like that's, that's like what you would want a good society. That's like a definition of a good society. And now we can, you know, Many people have from each according to his ability, right? To each according to his need. Like that's the like. There's been all these blueprints and all these like slogans. Like there's all this like. There's a lot of good. You know, if you want to spend some time reading all the utopian stuff, like there's a lot of people who's written about like what a good society would be. Um, and I'm saying that a little disparagingly because like a utopia is a utopia. Like it's it's not where you're actually going to end up. It's where you try to transform society to look like and you see how far you can go and you make changes along the way. That's like, I think that's been the true history of like the last 20, 200 years of like socialist politics of we have a good sense of like what most people would like in life. They would like some security, some, you know, enough uh, resources to like flourish that they have the means to flourish. Have you ever seen those like studies or polls or whatever that show that like getting more money, making more money will make you happier up to a certain point. And that cutoff is usually somewhere between like 70 to like a hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever. And it turns out like that's kind of what you need to live an upper middle class life. Right. Uh, and the study, the study, I mean, that's never explicitly pointed out in the studies. The point is always like making money won't make you happier. I mean, but it will up to a certain point to yeah. have, you know, not just the basic necessities of life, but like also enough to put away for retirement, to go on vacation, to like maybe, you know, like invest in a home or like, I don't know, support a family of four or whatever. It's, it's, I mean, the problem really, like you're saying, it's like, it's so stripped of the actual historical context that it's in. It's stripped of society. It imagines there is no society. It's just like, 
what does a human being with certain biological functions and, and, you know, needs in life, what do you actually need, you know, and it's this amount of money will satisfy these needs. And mm -hmm. I weirdly, don't know, maybe, I don't yeah, know why that is. Yeah, maybe. I Some don't know. arbitrary number. Yeah. No, you know, there's no inflation. There's no yeah. living standards. There's no, you know, zip codes. There's no, like, there's none of the fact that like, you know, the fact that in the U S like you got to pay for your healthcare out of pocket mm -hmm. or, you know, but, uh, all of this, I mean, the problem with all of these things, like, again, like the ideology around work just ends up at the point of it is to say like, you're an individual and you should try to do the best you can as an individual, because like, that's useful from the standpoint of like a capitalist to, you know, you showing back up to the job every day, or if not to the job, to the labor market, looking for the next job or something mm -hmm. But it's, you know, there's no, there's no conspiracy. There's no, you know, it's like, it's not that someone's like planning this out and saying, you know, there's no, like, you know, the, the people who work at like these media companies or at these advertising companies, the marketing firms, none of them are like, Hmm, let's, how do we reproduce capitalism? It's just right, like, no, this right. is just like, this is kind of what the system demands and mm -hmm. this is what's useful from the point of view of these, of the, of the system of, and of these capitalists. Um, and the problem is, is that like the people who make all this shit, the people who make these slogans, who talk about like, you know, what is going on in work today? How is work changing these, like all these like think pieces and articles and like, you know, people who make, I, I when we were doing the interview, I was like, how how do so many people have a job that makes so much money just like talking about ideology and like <laughs> how are people feeling and thinking it's like there's not that much to talk about like mm -hmm. ideology is not that complex like it's like work sucks people have to make sense of it i don't know like yeah. the problem is is that like these people wanna, are doing all this say, for middle i just want to say I, I love talking about ideology so <laughs> So if anybody out there wants to talk about ideology, don't come to Kale, come to me. But no, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah I'm, the, I'm the hater. This is good cop, bad cop ideology day <laughs> at Jacobin. Yeah. Um, but like, but the problem is just all these people are middle class. That like, there's been this massive divergence between like, the middle class has always been a distinct group of people. It's not just income. It's not like, it's not when you get to $70,000, all of a sudden you're now middle class. Like the point, like the, the whole reason why we call you a middle class person is because you are not subject to the same uh, constraints and compulsions and vagaries of of the working class labor market. That because you're either a manager, you you know you don't own the means of production, you don't own the productive assets, you don't own the firm, the business, whatever. But you boss people around, and you kind of do you know you're like useful to the boss. That you know like your job, your career ladder depends on like you know, how well you can like speed all these people up in their productivity and the boss will reward you with like, oh, mm -hmm. you're like the now the junior executive manager or some whatever. You make up some long title that's made that's just nonsense. Um, or you're like a professional person who, you know, you're, uh, you know, the reason why you're not working class in your middle class is because you have all these credentials because you went to these schools and you have certain yeah. knowledge that or certain skill sets that um make you harder to replace that like yeah. part of being part of life in capitalism as a working class person is that uh you know if you as an individual say screw this this isn't working for me the boss can say cool it's not working for me either get out i'm gonna bring someone else in mm -hmm. and a professional person if you're like a coder at google or something um there's not that many coders that's why they keep pushing for more coders because they're like shit we need to like replace our workforce at some point right yeah um yeah these like spoiled brats who like make our software uh that like make a ton of money because like they're hard to replace and if we replace right. if we get rid of one of them they're going to work at our competitor mm -hmm. uh right though that's not typical the fact that like right. middle class people as individuals can fight the boss to an extent limited but to an extent but that doesn't like, help anybody but themselves exactly yeah that doesn't raise wages you know among service sector workers that doesn't improve working conditions. You know, it's like, ultimately, I mean, it ends up becoming, it just, it becomes the case that like these become a large consumer base as well. And like, it ends up, it's like all the more reason for capitalists and other sectors to be like, oh, we got to speed up production because we got to cater to these people who need their package on time. Mm -hmm. So that's the, like the middle-class people are the ones who talk about 
what work is. And they say, this is how we understand what work is. It's, we're now all burned out. We're like, work is getting too hard. It's like becoming, you know, we don't have division between work and life. And mm -hmm. it's like, do you know what like a working class person in a factory a hundred years ago was like over a hundred, a hundred plus years ago was like, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, it's indisputable that uh, the kind of discourse that dominates the media, for example, is very much of this sort of like, you know, uh, white collar or professional managerial class, like millennial burnout, like, you know, like I did so many unpaid internships and now I feel like shit or something. And that is not representative, of course, of honestly, the vast majority of people, right? That is true. But at the same time, I do think that uh, parts of the professional managerial class, uh, as Catherine Liu might say, the, the professional part and less so the managerial part is actually facing a lot of downward pressure, right? Mm -hmm. um, or uh, some people might call, might call it proletarianization. Um, yeah. I think that that is true uh, um, as well. Yeah, well, I think that's... Um there's like there's something of a contradiction where like middle class people are increasingly facing working class work conditions yeah that there are all these think pieces in the new york times and wherever else are like you know should we really be surveilled this much and it's like that's just working class life like the boss perfected over 100 years ago you know like this is what taylorism is it's like the the boss and the managers like watch every single little thing that a worker is doing because they're like well you you're not working hard enough in this aspect of your job and you should be doing more otherwise we'll get rid of you and replace you with someone who will um middle class people are now facing that but uh their living standards are still very different right. that like they still live in a very different world than than working class people and part of that like we've been saying uh is the fact that like a good chunk of the middle class is working from home. Mm -hmm. uh, me yeah, and you, I think we're working from home. <laughs> we are we are working from home. This is my home. <laughs> yeah. Um. I. Yeah. I. I think though that. Um. I think that the. I think that you're absolutely right. The standard of living, obviously, for middle class people and for like low wage workers is radically different. Um, but it also is becoming harder and harder to reproduce middle class status, I think. I mean, there have been, you know, uh, I think a lot of great studies and even books recently about how college is just now bankrupting what might what were otherwise middle class families like people now have to people who are making like actually decent money like not low wage mcdonald's money like now have to plunder their retirement accounts and like you know uh, or, you know, like um, put their houses up at col as collateral, like in order to finance their children's education, aka in order to reproduce their class position. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's no, I mean, I guess, I, I guess it just goes back to, you know, Vivek Chibber, again, always, like that condition in and of itself isn't going to necessarily lead to the radicalization of these people. It isn't necessarily going to mean that they become part of a working class movement, um, but it, it just is. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, going back to what you said about the proletarianization of middle class people, that more and more of their life is subjected to markets and to like the the demands of the boss, that the boss has greater control over what they do in the workplace. Um, I think also, I mean, like you can you really can only understand this by understanding like the rise of like technology and computers mm -hmm. um, because the point of like, why do you even have a middle class in capitalism is the fact that like capitalists stripped workers of their like immediate like knowledge and skills in the workplace that they said, you don't really need to know how to do all this stuff. Like we're gonna um, take all the mental activity of work and put that into a different set of people who are professionals mm. or the managerial aspects, which are managers, um, who then take care of this other chunk of work. And I think more and more of that can be accomplished through technology that there has been like, we, when you think of like, like automation, there's been like scares since like the 1920s or so of like robots are going to take our jobs and it hasn't happened. Maybe it'll happen. It's unlikely. I mean, I it just, it's, it's never happened. It, it probably won't ever happen, but we'll see. I mean, it's hard to say, but, well, but, but for okay, middle class but, people, it kind of has happened. Like middle class people, you don't, you can, you can just get like robots to like automate a lot of like this kind of like um, 
you know, accounting, this like bookkeeping, this surveillance, like you don't need all of these middle-class people. And so I, my guess, I don't know exactly, but my guess is like, that's probably why more and more middle-class people get like thrown into, you know, working class life. Professionals, mm. because they're constantly, capitalists are constantly de-skilling. They're constantly saying, you don't need to know all this information. Well, like, you know, we can subdivide it, mm -hmm. give it to other yeah. people. You know, it's funny because there is an, I mean, I think that there is definitely an element of that. But again, just to go back to how infinitely adaptable capitalism is, when you think about the transition to what we might call post-Fordism, like basically to this new flexible style of production, mm -hmm. part of it was to um, break down some division of labor, right? So mm -hmm. like under the Fordis model, it used to be like you, for your entire adult life, you'd work on the same assembly line doing the exact same job, like screwing a cap onto like a bottle of toothpaste or something. Um, under the post-Fortis regime, uh, we now have employers who are interested in things like, you know, multitasking and, you know, let's let's get you off the assembly line and, and uh, get you doing some other things and that'll make things more interesting. But what it also means is that they can save on labor costs that way. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.